They died of suffocation. There's no water found in the lungs. The small ice crystals in the blood indicate they probably froze in less than five hours. That requires something less than 300 below zero. Now, it never gets 300 below zero on Earth. The coldest temperature ever recorded from National Pornographic a Geographic is minus 127 degrees. That's pretty chilly. But that's not cold enough to freeze the mammoths. What happened to freeze the mammoths? In 1999, I was uh, preaching in Alaska, and I took the little tour on the, to go out on a boat to see the Portage Glacier. And I'm standing next to this guy on the boat. I got talking to him, trying to witness to him. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I drill for oil in Barrow, Alaska, near Barrow, Alaska. I said, well, when you drill down, do you find anything interesting down there? He said, you wouldn't believe the stuff we drill into down there. He said, just a few months ago, we were drilling down. We drilled through 1,000 feet of permanently frozen ground called permafrost, and we started bringing up pieces of wood. And we always take whatever comes out of the well and lay it out on the ground so we can get a sample, a core sample of what we're drilling through to know the formation. He said, we drilled straight through a tree that was standing up. The tree was 300 feet tall, standing up, under a thousand feet of permanently frozen ground. Well, I preached in Barrow, Alaska a couple years ago. There is only one tree in Barrow, Alaska, and it is about this tall in a Chinese restaurant, and they struggle to keep it alive because they don't get much sun up there for months at a time. There are no trees outside in Barrow, Alaska. There are certainly no trees 300 feet tall. There are very few trees in the world that are 300 feet tall. How do you get a tree 300 feet tall, standing up under 1,000 feet of permanently frozen ground? What happened? I'm going to give you what I call the Hoven theory of what caused all these phenomena, but I need to review a little science for you. Many people have been influential in developing this in my brain anyway. I appreciate Walt Brown and Henry Morris and Baumgartner and some of these guys that have done work. And the biblical flood in the ice epoch had a great influence on me. But ultimately, I have to take the blame for this if it's wrong. I'm going to teach you a few things about science and then give you the Hoven theory. The inverse square law tells us if two objects are attracted to each other, like the earth and the moon, the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In English, that means if you half the distance, or if you brought the moon into one-third the distance, you take the one-third, flip it over, and square it. It's, one, it's now nine times the gravitational pull. Inverse square laws apply when you're dealing with forces involving gravity, light, magnetism, and girls. I travel every single week. I believe I've been home eight Sundays in 14 years. I flew 215 times last year. It was gone 210 days away from home. So I get to come home every week. When I get a certain distance from my wife, it's, Hello, dear, how are you doing? When you half the distance, it is four times the attraction, not two, four times the attraction. When you half the distance again, it is too late. So guys, the secret is stay about 10 feet away and you won't have a problem, okay? Now, the inverse square law is one thing to learn. The second thing you need to learn is a spinning top, any spinning object, behaves in a peculiar way if it is struck by something. If you throw a rock at a spinning top, it'll wobble around for a while, or you can do it with a gyroscope. And it'll wobble around, and then it'll, it'll recover, spinning smoothly, usually at some new crazy angle. You can actually d determine when it was struck, if you could see a graph of a wavy line of how it behaved as it was wobbling. Interesting. The Earth has no doubt wobbled through the years. The North Pole has moved around. Today, the Earth is tilted over 23 and a half degrees, which is why they always mount the globe on that 23 and a half degree angle. Stonehenge is an interesting... Uh, stone building. Apparently, it was built to worship the sun at summer solstice. But today, Stonehenge does not line up. The temple Amun-Ra was also apparently built to worship the sun at summer solstice, the lo longest day of the year. But it doesn't line up. Edexus, same thing. The earth is tilted over today, and that's what causes the seasons. Uh, usually on June 21st, occasionally on June 20th, but usually June 21st, it's the longest day of the year because the earth is tilted, in, in our case with the northern hemisphere, we're tilted toward the sun. So we get more sunlight, and the North Pole gets pure sunlight all the time, 24 hours. George Dodwell, the famous Australian astronomer, did a lot of study of the shadows, of the solstice shadows recorded by ancient astronomers. 
He said, you know, it looks to me like something struck the earth. When he followed the wavy line made of the solstice shadows, he said something struck the earth about 4,350 years ago and caused the earth to wobble for several thousand years. Today the earth is pretty stable. The earth's north pole doesn't move around very much. But could it be that something actually struck planet earth about the time of Noah's flood? Now that's what the scientific evidence points toward. Interesting. Today the earth is tilted over and that's what causes the seasons. The first mention of cold weather in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 8, after the flood. I doubt they had huge polar ice caps before the flood came. I drove, flew up as far as we could fly in Canada and then drove two hours north of that, way up into central Saskatchewan. We were only right about here. There was a whole lot of earth above us. But they said, this is about the limit of, of habitable, uh, uh, habitable land where you can actually do farming because north of here, the seasons are too harsh. You can't do any farming. There is a huge chunk of planet Earth, north and south, near the poles, that is simply unusable for farmland. Now, the Bible says God formed the world to be inhabited. I don't think what we have today is anything similar to what Adam and Eve saw. Next thing you need to, need to keep in mind, the moon has craters on it. But we never see the moon get struck by anything. Where did these craters come from on the moon? Even Mercury has craters on it. Where did these craters come from? Mars has a canyon much larger than Grand Canyon. When the scientists studied this canyon on Mars, they said, wow, this canyon formed in a matter of weeks. Because they say there was melting water in one of the craters, it overflowed the rim and washed out this canyon very, very quickly. Well, duh. Why can they see a canyon on Mars where we can't find any water for sure and say this thing formed quickly and you can look at Grand Canyon on planet Earth and can't conclude that water formed that canyon very quickly? <laughs> I don't understand the stupidity involved here. Looks to me like you ought to be able to see that. As a ridge at the edge of the crater gave way and this canyon formed in a matter of months, certainly less than a year, said one of the scientists. Next thing to keep in mind, it's called the Meisner effect. How many have ever seen two magnets? You put them together and the one will float on top of the other one. You know what it's talking about here? It's called the Meisner effect. That's how the Japanese trains go. We rode on one of those trains when I was in Japan. Man, they go flying down the tracks with magnetic levitation. No uh, resistance that way, no friction. Next thing to keep in mind, there are comets flying around through space and these comets are extremely cold. 300 to 400 below zero Fahrenheit. Don't lick it. I need to find out if any of you are or were as dumb as I was as a kid. <clears throat> How many of you have a piece of your tongue stuck to a pump handle or a flagpole someplace on planet Earth right now because you, lick, you licked it when it was cold? Come on now, be honest. Put your hand up. Okay, there's several. All right. Don't lick something 300 below zero. Trust me on that one. Okay, that'll be the last thing you lick for a while. If you throw a snowball too fast, it'll break apart. You couldn't possibly shoot a snowball out of a cannon. If you did, it would simply break apart in pieces before it even got out the end of the barrel. So a super cold ice meteor, if it were coming toward the Earth, would build up speed because of the inverse square law. As it got going faster and faster, it would break up out in space into a bazillion little ice crystals. Those would then shower down on the Earth as super cold snow. Next thing you need to keep in mind, the Earth has a very strong magnetic field, but it's getting weaker. At the time of the flood, it was probably about 15 to 20 times stronger than it is today. The magnetic field is weakening. The magnetic field would deflect super cold ice crystals to the poles, most of them. Also, super cold ice is easily statically charged. The northern lights are caused because of the Earth's magnetic field. How many have ever seen the northern lights? Unbelievably gorgeous. If you've never seen them, it's worth just get up there. So I've seen them in South Dakota and up in Canada. Unbelievably beautiful. The northern lights are, are something to worth seeing. Anyway, the pre-flood world was very different. The world probably had a canopy of ice or water above the atmosphere. We cover that on video two. Now there are some creationists, including Walt Brown, who disagree. They say there was no canopy. And I think the arguments they use can be easily answered. And I'd be glad to discuss that if you'd like more.